Uh, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here today to share with you some recent results uh, that potentially tie gravitational wave observables related to the post-merger evolution of a binary neutral star merger with nuclear physics or microphysical details of the equation of state. Um, so the title of the talk is Revealing Phase Transitions with Gravitational Wave uh, Spectroscopy of Binary Neutral Star Mergers, which is a mouthful, but hopefully by the end of the, the first half of the talk, uh, you'll understand some of these keywords if you're not familiar with them already. Um, so here's the outline for my talk. It's roughly broken up into four parts. Uh, uh, the first two parts are fairly pedagogical. I'll introduce neutron stars and binary neutron stars and why we're interested in them and what are some of uh, the kind of leading edge questions re related to neutron star astrophysics. Um, uh, and then I'll highlight and give some background uh, about the neutron star equation of state and some potential uh, possibilities there and how we could learn about this. Uh, then I'll highlight uh, results from a recent project. Um, and finally, I'll conclude. Uh, so let's start off with some background. Um, every, every time I talk about neutron stars, I like to pose them as ideal physics laboratories. And by the end of the section, you'll see why. Um, but first of all, what is a neutron star? So a neutron star is uh, the remnant of massive stellar death. So on the top left of the slide, I have a cartoon of a massive main sequence star, very much like our own sun. Um, only let's assume that this cartoon has, or th this represents a star with uh, at least 10 times the mass of our sun. Uh, for stars like this, uh, their life cycle and dynamics is determined by uh, really two balancing interactions. There's the massive self-gravity of the star represented by that green arrow that wants to compactify the object. Uh, and then there are internal processes that stabilize against that tendency for gravitational collapse, such as hydrostatic pressure, uh, in the core, the relevant uh, processes are fusion processes that, that, uh, where you have the fusion of elements into heavier uh, or lighter elements into heavier elements. This is happening in our own sun from hydrogen to helium. But for these massive stars, you can go all the way to iron where uh, uh, iron is essentially nuclear ash. The, the conditions inside of these objects is not conducive to fusing iron. So these uh, processes that, that are stalling the gravitational collapse disappear there. Um, uh, and the result is a runaway gra gravitational collapse until some other kind of balancing or restoring uh, force is reached. In the uh, case of these massive stars, that's neutron degeneracy. Um, uh, so uh, what happens at the core is that as it becomes more compact, it also becomes more neutron rich. Um, uh, and uh, in this movie, in the bottom left part of the slide, I'll just show the last few moments of this, uh, what we call a core collapse. Um, uh, this is what it would look like in the case of the crab uh, supernova, or would have looked like, uh, which was a supernova explosion detected in the 11th century um, uh, by astronomers around the world. Uh, and you can see that uh, the result of, of that kind of initial gravitational collapse and the stall of that by, by neutron degeneracy results in a shock that blows the outer layers of that star uh, off. Um, if we were to look at the Crab uh, Nebula today, we would, look, we would see something like this and buried in, uh, near the center of that explosion is the object I'm interested in, is that leftover remnant uh, degenerate neutron core, the neutron star. Um, uh, so these objects uh, inherit quite a bit of mass from their progenitors. Uh, they, they're typically found to be somewhere between one and two solar masses, but are tiny uh, uh, in length scale, uh, typically only around 10 kilometers in radius. And just to give you a sense of uh, what that is, uh, that length scale, here is my neutron star cartoon superimposed near the surface of the Earth uh, near New York City. Um, you can see these objects are tiny, uh, same length scale as a typical city, but can in, uh, hold anywhere between one and two solar masses or uh, possibly even more. Um, okay, so oftentimes these objects are formed in binary systems or form binary systems. Um, uh, and here uh, 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 we can receive quite a lot of information and uh, learn a lot of, uh, uh, learn a lot of uh, things about neutron stars and their, uh, uh, these binary systems um, uh, due to the fact that they also emit in uh, 
uh, not just gravitational waves, but also um, uh, electromagnetic counterparts. So in this movie, I'll kind of just go through the, the life cycle of a binary neutron star. Uh, what you're looking at in the first shot here is a, a globular cluster. Um, uh, this green track uh, is the neutron star before it forms, an, or the system before it forms a binary neutron star. You can see in this movie, these two stars are represented by these two cores that orbit one another. The theory of general relativity predicts that uh, as these two objects orbit one another, their orbit decays as they emit gravitational radiation. And gravitational waves uh, from this kind of in spiral were detected for the first time in 2017 at uh, LIGO uh, in the event that we labeled GW170817. Um, uh, as, as these two objects in spiral, and as was shown in this movie, um, uh, leading up to the merger, there's an increase in the frequency of that orbit. Uh, and this results in what we call a chirp signal. So you'll see this kind of exponential increase of the frequency, uh, but accompanied with this detection uh, was also uh, uh, detections in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, in particular in uh, gamma rays, uh, just uh, under two seconds after uh, this chirp signal was detected, a large increase in, uh, in the counts of gamma rays per second at the Fermi Gamma Ray uh, Telescope were detected. So now we, know, we, we now understand that gamma ray bursts of the, this kind are associated with binary neutron star mergers. Um, but also associated with this are transients on, are astronomical transients on slightly longer timescales uh, of a few days, uh, what we call kilonovae, and are associated with the radioactive decay of heavy, heavy elements produced in such mergers. Uh, so there's a lot of rich astrophysics we can learn from these kinds of systems and their mergers. Um, I'm particularly interested in what happens after the merger, which I'll discuss a bit more about in the next few slides. Uh, so now, uh, hopefully you start to see my uh, perspective of why I think neutron stars are ideal uh, physics laboratories. They have relevant physics happening from throughout the four fundamental interactions of nature. Um, we know they're some of the most compact objects in the universe uh, and produce observable gravitational waves. Um, in order to understand neutron stars, we must deal with them within the full theory of GR. Um, but they're also associated with intense electromagnetic uh, signals. Uh, not only do neutron stars house the strongest magnetic fields we know of in the universe, but we now know they're also associated with things like short gamma ray bursts and kilonovae and possibly even fast radio bursts. Uh, the physics of the weak interaction is very relevant for neutron stars. Um, neutrinos may play a, a huge role in determining the composition of the matter uh, after, after the merger, uh, and they're also crucial in the early stages of when these objects are born. Um, uh, also, the physics of the strong interaction is very relevant here. Um, uh, uh, in particular, uh, in the case where the densest regions of neutron stars may uh, reach the conditions for what we call a deconfinement phase transition or QCD phase transition. And that's gonna be the focus of the rest of the talk. It's kind, uh, kind of gonna look at the interplay between these two interactions. Is it possible that if there is a deconfinement phase transition uh, that occurs after a binary neutron star merger, that this has any impact on the gravitational wave observables coming from uh, these systems? Uh, so uh, in the second part of this introductory uh, or pedagogical part of the talk, um, I'll review some of the methods that I use. I work within the field of numerical relativity where the aim is to solve Einstein's equations on the computer or with numerical methods. Um, so the equations of interest are shown here. Um, uh, the left-hand side is what we call the Einstein tensor, whereas the right-hand side is what we call the stress energy tensor. Uh, as Max said earlier, typically he deals with systems where this is zero, but I'm interested in systems where this describes uh, or approximates the conditions inside of uh, neutron stars. Um, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, works within this four-dimensional space-time manifold, which I'll uh, represent here by this 2D mesh. Uh, the left-hand side deals with deformations in that space-time manifold. Um, uh, what we call curvature and the dynamics of that curvature, whereas the right-hand side deals with the, the energy content or stress energy specifically. In the case of neutron stars, I've placed my little star here. Uh, and that's just to show that this, this object will be represented by the stress energy tensor. 
Um, within the field of numerical relativity, typically the approach we take uh, is to take a step back from this four dimensional theory and uh, work within what we call the three plus one decomposition or ADM decomposition by another name, uh, where we cast Einstein's equations into uh, three dimensions plus one. So that at uh, some fixed time hypersurface within your four dimensional manifold, you have all of the information necessary to describe everything on that on that fixed time slice uh, and additional auxiliary information to evolve that forward. And this is very conducive for numerical evolution. Um, uh, the right-hand side is uh, in the particular case of neutron stars, we typically assume a form for the stress energy tensor uh, that looks like this, uh, for, uh, which represents ideal, uh, or it's an ideal stress energy tensor. Uh, where rho here is the rest mass density, H is the uh, enthalpy, specific enthalpy, P is the pressure, the fluid, uh, U is the forward velocity, and G is the metric tensor. Um, uh, and typically, in order to understand the dynamics of matter, we, we work with conservation laws. So we assume, for example, that this stress energy tensor is conserved. We work with the Maxwell equations. We assume that the rest mass is conserved and other things like uh, the lepton uh, fraction or electron fraction in this case. Um, so what we get is basically systems of coupled differential equations dealing with each parts of uh, this side of, our, of Einstein's equations, um, which we must solve numerically. Um, and just quickly, I'd like to highlight some, some tools of the trade um, uh, because there's been a, a very nice community effort uh, to open source a lot of the numerical codes that, that uh, we use in the field. Uh, typically a numerical relativity uh, problem is broken up into roughly four parts. Uh, there's the initial state of your simulations, which we call the initial data problem, which have to be a, a full solution of Einstein's uh, uh, equations. Uh, if you put garbage into your simulations, you're going to get garbage out. So you have to ensure uh, that this uh, initial time step is a full solution, uh, which is not trivial at all. Uh, the left and right hand side of Einstein's equations uh, cover the space time and hydrodynamics evolution respectively. Um, and we're currently in a state where there are many different methods for implementing each, or, uh, the three plus one equations as well as uh, the hydro, GR hydro equations. Um, and we're also interested in uh, extracting physically meaningful things from our simulations, such as gravitational waves. Um, and uh, I just wanna point out a nice community effort, this Einstein toolkit, which is a, a open source suite of codes that kind of collects each parts of a numerical relativity problem <laughs> under one common infrastructure. Um, this is a code you can visit this website and download. They have plenty of examples to kind of get you started um, if you're interested in, in research in this field. Um, and I'll also highlight some uh, recent codes that I've uh, published, uh, which you can download at this link below, which extend some of the, the codes in the Einstein toolkit. Great, so that uh, ends kind of the first part of the talk. Um, uh, we can move on to some uh, astrophysics now. Uh, uh, in particular, the remainder of the talk is going to focus on the neutron star equation of state. Um, so in this context, by the neutron star equation of state, I'm referring to really this pressure energy density functional, uh, which is, uh, gives a description of the matter inside of neutron stars. Um, uh, we have some understanding of what this relationship looks like at relatively low densities near nuclear saturation from Earth-based uh, collider experiments, such as heavy ion collision. Um, and some theoretical understanding of very high energies, well above what you'd expect inside of a neutron star, um, where we expect the degrees of freedom in a strongly interacting dense system to be uh, quarks rather than hadrons. However, the intermediate region between these two extremes uh, and the densities most relevant to neutron stars remain very uncertain in terms of the equation of state. Uh, what I'm showing here in this particular plot uh, these dashed lines uh, represent uh, the kind of allowed bounds using um, uh, our, uh, on the equation of state from inferences of neutron star properties. Uh, and I've kind of shown this red arrow uh, because the way we uh, understand these bounds is from uh, measurements of macroscopic properties of neutron star, in particular their masses and radii. Uh, 
Uh, so there's uh, a one-to-one -one correlation between some theoretical model of the equation of state and the masses and radii of uh, uh, compact uh, neutron stars. So typically the way these kinds of constraints are placed is by using observations of or inferences of the masses and radii of neutron stars and kind of working backwards and seeing if some theoretical model is consistent with those predictions. Um, so to, just to give you a flavor of what some of these observations are, um, for example, we can look at X-ray probes of neutron star properties. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, the one sigma contour for uh, the inferred masses and radii of these individual objects from the globular clusters that emit in the X-ray. Um, we can, you can imagine taking one of these contours, placing it here and seeing whether some theoretical model of your equation of state is consistent with those masses and radii. Um, more recently, we can also turn to gravitational wave observations uh, to understand uh, in particular, uh, the radii of neutron stars uh, by inferring the tidal properties of the stars in the late in spiral stage of the merger. Um, so uh, the tidal information is encoded in this parameter lambda tilde, which we call uh, the tidal deformability. And it turns out this lambda tilde is very sensitive to the neutron star radius. Um, uh, so uh, we can uh, predict what gravitational waves uh, up, to, up to the merger would look like for different uh, tidal deformabilities uh, and kind of work backwards from uh, from the observed gravitational waves to infer what lambda should be and thereby place constraints on the neutron star radius and finally go backwards to the equation of state. Uh, presently, uh, uh, observation or the event GW170817 appears to prefer smaller radius neutron stars uh, uh, for, uh, of about uh, 14 kilometers or less. Uh, even more recently, we can turn back to X-ray observations, uh, but on a smaller uh, length scale, uh, uh, there are regions near the, on the surface of neutron star that emit quite brightly in the X-ray um, spectrum. Um, uh, and if we, uh, and depending on uh, the macroscopic properties of your star, the masses and radii, the light curves coming from that neutron star hotspot, uh, X-ray hotspot on the surface uh, changes. Uh, so uh, we can, use these X-ray observations to infer the masses and radii of neutron stars. This has been done for two objects uh, with the NICER uh, mission. Um, for an object of about 1.4 solar masses or so, uh, they predict that the radius is somewhere around 13 kilometers. Um, uh, and for a more massive object, uh, you find a similar radius. Um, so we're, we're now in an age or an era where we're starting to understand neutron star properties uh, better and better. Uh, and this allows us to uh, place better and better constraints on the equation of state and understand uh, what, for example, some of the degrees of freedom uh, at these densities are. Uh, one of the more interesting possibilities, in my opinion, is where you have a deconfinement phase transition occurring at these densities. Um, uh, and just to kind of uh, clarify a bit more what I mean by that, uh, I'm uh, in this lower right plot down here, I'm showing the QCD phase diagram where the vertical axis or the vertical axis shows the temperature in a strongly interacting system and the, the horizontal axis uh, represents the density. Uh, for the conditions we're used to dealing with here on earth, uh, this quote unquote ordinary, ordinary matter, uh, we're at relatively low densities and temperatures where we expect uh, the matter to be in, in states of uh, confined or in hadronic states where the quarks uh, are confined to states of two or three. Um, uh, as we increase the energy scale of a strongly interacting system, we expect that uh, the interaction strength of the quarks decreases. And there are several ways of doing so. You can increase the temperature, but you could also increase the density in your system. Uh, and uh, by reaching extreme densities, you can uh, reach a condition where the quarks are essentially free to interact with a larger system. And this is what I refer to as a uh, deconfinement phase transition or QCD phase transition. And it's possible that uh, this kind of uh, transition could uh, occurs at the densities relevant to neutron stars. This is completely consistent with the astrophysical observations of neutron stars. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to refer to uh, 
uh, hadronic matter, neutron matter, or ordinary matter is confined kind of state interchangeably by these terms. And quark matter um, uh, will refer to uh, this, this system of weakly interacting quarks, something like a quark gluon plasma. Okay, um, so it turns out that for uh, equations of state with the, this kind of deconfinement phase transition, uh, we can very nicely classify them based on just a, a handful of uh, parameters that determine uh, <coughs> mainly the, the characteristics of the mass radius relationship. Uh, in particular, these two parameters uh, or the set of parameters include the gap in energy density separating the two phases. Uh, where below some energy density, you expect to find only hadrons, and above some energy density, you expect to find only quarks. And the gap in energy density really is a measure of how, how wide the separation is. Uh, there's also uh, P transition and epsilon transition, which are respectively the pressure and energy density uh, at which the phase transition first occurs, so that any values above this uh, correspond to either a mixed quark phase or a pure quark phase. Um, and it turns out that if you explore this parameter space, you can quite nicely classify uh, the, your equations of state uh, by looking at the, the kind of properties of the masses and radii of neutron stars they produce, uh, or this mass radius curve, uh, which you saw a few slides ago. Um, so these little insets here are cartoon mass radius curves. And you can see that at re relatively low pressure and energy density, you have a continuation from uh, the neutron star properties shown in green here uh, at, to the uh, hybrid star properties where you have some amount of quarks near the center of, uh, of the star uh, shown in red. Uh, as you increase delta epsilon, you can have a discontinuity between the two branches. Um, and by moving around this parameter space, you get uh, essentially four different types of mass radius curves. So uh, one aim in our, uh, our work, which I'll highlight some details of in a bit here, uh, was to kind of explore this parameter space as much as possible. In particular, consider many different equations of state across delta epsilon, uh, and thereby consider many different strengths of the phase transition. This will turn out to be pretty important for some of the results I'll show in a bit. So if these phase transitions do occur at the densities relevant to binary neutron star mergers, we have some understanding of the effects that they could have on gravitational wave observables. Uh, from numerical studies. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the uh, a post-merger spectrum. So the amplitude of gravitational waves as a function of their frequency. Uh, and typically what we expect in a post-merger spectrum is something like this black line. You get a very pronounced peak uh, in your spectrum or uh, at, at, uh, uh, at some characteristic frequency uh, having to do with the dynamics of some post-merger remnant. Okay, and it's been shown with numerical studies that if you allow for deconfinement phase transition, there's kind of a systematic shift toward higher values, uh, especially in this peak. Uh, and this may be detectable in future generation gravitational wave detectors, um, but this effect remains small. It's on the order of a few percent and it's not always seen in the simulations. So we were curious as to whether there were any other potential effects uh, that uh, these deconfinement phase transitions could have um, uh, on this post-merger spectrum. So to that end, we ran uh, many simulations, um, a set of simulations, and importantly within our set of simulations, we considered pairs of simulations where uh, they start from the same initial conditions. Uh, one simulation allows for only hadronic degrees of freedom. The other allows for uh, a quark deconfinement phase transition. Um, importantly also, uh, we considered uh, a, a wide range of the energy density gap that parameter that measures the strength of the phase transition, essentially. Uh, we, uh, for the results I'll show here today, we fix the mass ratio to one, but we've also considered simulations where uh, the mass ratio is not one. Um, and this may have some role on some of the uh, <coughs> dynamics I'll point out uh, uh, related to the post-merger remnant. Uh, we use the whiskey thc code to evolve the hydrodynamics and the CT gamma code for the space time. Uh, and build our initial conditions with uh, Lorraine. Um, right, so uh, I'll move on now to uh, uh, the details of the project that relate uh, potentially uh, features of equations of state with a high density phase transition to gravitational wave observables, uh, particularly in the post-merger. 
Um, so here's an example of one of our simulations or an animation for one of our simulations. Uh, shown in red is a measure of the density in the stars. Um, uh, as you'll see here in a bit, uh, the two stars will come together and merge and form this single metastable object. Uh, this object is in a state of high differential rotation. So regions near the center of the object rotate much faster than regions further away. And it turns out that this kind of environment is perfect for the development of fluid instabilities. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, well, a requirement for things like the magnetorotational instability is differential rotation. But in particular for this talk, I'm going to focus on fluid instabilities, such as the, uh, in particular, the one-arm spiral instability. Um, so uh, in this next slide, we can have a more quantitative look uh, at that same simulation um, uh, and at the density there. Uh, uh, we're looking at the same system just on the XY plane on the equatorial plane of the stars uh, and shown with this color bar is uh, a measure of the density. Um, I'll highlight the densest regions in this uh, post-merger remnant with different colors. Uh, and to the left here, we have a, a, a kind of legend uh, where I'll highlight the densest modes using different colors, depending on whether there's a single high density mode, two high density modes, or something different, right? Uh, so typically in the post-merger environment, you'll, what, you'll uh, what you'll see in this movie in a bit is that this bar mode where there are two high density regions in your uh, post-merger remnant um, is, is initially the most dominant mode. And this makes sense due to its <laughs> binary origin. Um, however, uh, another ubiquitous kind of uh, fluid pattern that arises is when you have a single high density mode. And this is what we refer to as the one arm spiral mode. Uh, so you'll see here in a second that uh, the two stars will merge and you'll see this kind of peanut shaped deformation reminiscent of something like the bar mode. Um, this bar mode quickly decays after the merger and gives way to the dominance of a single high density mode. Um, so in this case, what you're seeing is the development of this one arm spiral instability. Um, uh, uh, differential rotation, again, is required for uh, the development of this kind of instability, but is ubiquitously found uh, after a binary neutron star merger. Uh, this kind of instability is seen quite commonly in our simulations, um, regardless of initial conditions. Uh, so I want to emphasize that here we have an equal mass ratio binary. So there really is no M equals one perturbation to begin with, um, uh, but it develops anyway. So uh, another way to uh, assess the growth of these uh, spiral modes or uh, density modes uh, is by looking at uh, a decomposition of the density in, in the azimuthal plane uh, using this integral here. Uh, the, the amplitude or the coefficients of this decomposition will tell us essentially which is the dominant mode as a function of time. Um, so uh, this plot on the left, is exactly that as a function of time for the simulation you saw in the past two slides. Um, and as we saw in the previous simulation or the pr previous slide, uh, the blue mode, this bar mode was initially dominant but quickly decayed and gave way to the dominance of the one-arm spiral mode. Uh, what's particularly interesting about the one-arm spiral instability uh, is that these kinds of post-merger oscillations are related to gravitational wave observables. Um, so uh, the, uh, recall that a post-merger spectrum looks something like this, uh, where you have a very pronounced peak shown in blue here. Um, uh, this has to do with the, the dominant dynamics of the post-merger remnant um, and typically has to do with this kind of quadrupole uh, bar mode uh, uh, deformation in the density. In situations where the one-arm spiral instability develops, we also expect to see a significant signal uh, or uh, a very, uh, yeah, significant signal at exactly half that frequency. This is because this fluid pattern is exactly half of this bar mode pattern, right? And has exactly half uh, the, the pattern frequency as this bar mode. So this kind of two peaked um, spectrum, very unique spectrum is the telltale sign of the one arm spiral instability. If you were to detect this in a future generation uh, gravitational wave detector, uh, you can, say that uh, the one arm spiral instability is developing there. So what we have found is that uh, 
deconfinement phase transitions appear to suppress the development of uh, the one the one arm ability. Uh, they suppress not just the one-arm fire instability, but any fluid instability. Uh, but the effect on the post-merger spectrum is mainly seen in that subdominant mode. So we can look at something like the, uh, the amplitude of that density decomposition as a function of time. This is uh, the plot you saw on the last slide and corresponds to a simulation with purely hadronic degrees of freedom. For a simulation with the same initial conditions, but only changing the equation of state that is allowing for deconfinement phase transition, what we see is uh, that this red mode never overtakes the blue mode, right? Uh, the one arm spiral instability is quenched here. Um, so this is reflected in the gravitational wave spectra. Uh, uh, so what, what I'm showing here are two gravitational wave spectra for a pair of simulations. Again, the one on the left corresponds to a purely hadronic uh, simulation or simulation with purely hadronic degrees of freedom in the equation of state. And the one on the right uh, uh, starts from the same initial conditions, but allows for deconfinement phase transition. You can see this very pronounced double peaked feature pointing to the development of the one arm spiral instability in the hadronic case. Um, and uh, a, a suppression of that subdominant peak in the case where quarks appear. Uh, I've superimposed here on top of these spectra, the noise curves for several future generation gravitational wave detectors. And this becomes very interesting in that context. Um, uh, for instance, uh, this red line corresponds to uh, the noise, uh, is the noise curve for the Cosmic Explorer 20 kilometer uh, gravitational wave detector. And you'll see, you'll notice a feature there where there's an increase in sensitivity at high frequencies. Uh, these detectors are uh, very well suited for detecting that po those post-merger oscillations. So these kinds of oscillations will be in, in the grasp of our future generation gravitational wave detectors. Uh, where exactly this increase in sensitivity is depends on the design of the detector. So if we were after understanding whether phase transition occurs, we may think about putting this, uh, this increase in sensitivity uh, near the uh, subdominant peak. So rather than uh, somewhere between two and three kilohertz where we expect this uh, dominant peak, uh, we may think of placing it somewhere around one to two. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that may allow us to understand whether deconfinement phase transition actually occurs after a binary neutron star merger. By measuring something like the signal to noise ratio, right? I can me measure the signal to noise ratio of this peak uh, and uh, compare it to the signal to noise ratio at the dominant peak. Um, and that may allow me to see um, whether a deconfinement phase transition occurred there. So just to drive the point home, I'll flip between each of these, uh, each of these uh, spectra. So this one uh, is the hadronic case. This is the core case. You'll see that the SNR at the dominant peak does not really change. There is that small shift toward higher values in, uh, in the dominant peak, which is an effect that's already been observed. Um, and our simulations for the first time show the suppression at the subdominant peak. Uh, one of the more interesting findings of this work um, uh, is that there appears to be an anti-correlation in uh, the strength of the one arm fire instability, or say the signal to noise ratio at F peak over two and the strength of the phase transition. So recall that we ran many simulations, not just the ones uh, I showed data for in the past few slides. Um, and if we plot something like, something that's proportional to the SNR at F peak over two divided by the SNR at F peak as a function of the, uh, this energy density gap, which measures the strength in the phase transition, we see this kind of trend, downward trend. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of scatter here. Um, but if I isolate the simulations that start from the same initial conditions, you'll see the trend become much clearer. So all of these simulations start from the same initial conditions and there's a very clear trend of the suppression uh, as do these two uh, and as do these two. So one thing we can do to try to clarify this trend is just to normalize uh, this measure of the strength of the one arm spiral instability for each simulation at finite delta epsilon, or that allows for a quark deconfinement phase transition by its analogous simulation that starts from the same initial conditions. Uh, and there you start to see a much clearer trend. 
So this is a, a pretty new result. There remains a lot to be done here. Um, uh, 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 for instance, a follow-up study will try to control some of the systematics associated with uh, uncertainties in the hadronic regime of the equation of state, um, as well as consider uh, unequal mass ratio or more unequal mass ratio cases to see if we can uh, understand whether this trend is robust or not. Uh, so I have plenty of time left. I have some backup slides. So I'll come back to the conclusion. Um, uh, in particular, I want to just spend a bit of time on error bars, um, might as well, since I have some time. Um, uh, so uh, because this is a, numer a numerical study, uh, we, we can run experiments to try to understand some of the systematics associated with uh, our numerical uh, approaches. So one thing we did was to run each simulation at different grid resolutions to see whether the trend held. Um, and indeed, we, we do find that the trend holds for uh, different resolution simulations, uh, although with, with some error associated with it. So this is something we definitely want to revisit uh, in the future work. And finally, um, uh, uh, before I conclude, I'll just uh, highlight this unequal, unequal mass ratio or this pair of unequal mass ratio simulations where we observe the same thing. Uh, the reason unequal mass ratio cases are so interesting is because while well, they're more probably more common than equal mass ratio uh, cases astrophysically, um, and there's an inherent one or, or n equals one uh, perturbation in the system itself. So um, your, your remnant will be born with a kind of tendency for that one arm spiral instability to develop. Um, and indeed, we see the same kind of suppression in this unequal mass ratio case. Um, here's the, uh, the unequal mass ratio case is shown with this gold star along with the, the rest of the simulations. And you can see that it's quite similar to the equal mass ratio case of the same delta epsilon. Um, great, so yeah, in conclusion, um, uh, what I've shown is that these deconfinement phase transitions appear to suppress one arm spiral instability, uh, the, the one arm spiral instability. Uh, moreover, there appears to be an anti-correlation between the strength of the, uh, the phase transition and the strength of the instability, uh, such that the stronger the phase transition, the stronger the suppression, or in other words, the weaker the instability. Um, what's really interesting about this is that this instability is associated with a very unique gravitational wave uh, observable. This double peaked feature um, is the telltale sign that your instability is developing. Um, uh, and because of that, well, we also have found that um, because these post-merger oscillations are within the graphs of, uh, of future generation detectors, um, this is a very interesting source to consider uh, in that context. Um, we, we should be able to determine with uh, enough systems whether a one arm spiral instability develops uh, ubiquitously after binary neutron star mergers. Um, uh, future work will consider some of the systematics in our uh, in our study um, by assuming a fixed hadronic equations of state equation of state uh, so that we only vary the features of the quark equation of state and understand the effects there um, as well as consider uh, other effects such as magnetic fields and unequal mass ratio um, so uh, thank you for listening um, uh, I especially like to thank my collaborators uh, especially Avaral Prakash, who's a senior graduate student at Penn State and has done tremendous work on this project, uh, but also Professor David Radice and uh, Dr. Domenico Logoteta. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Pedro. Um, do we have any questions in the room or online? Yeah, go ahead. So I was. Yeah, I don't, do you want to use your mic? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was a really nice talk. I was wondering if the individual stars doing hypothetic rotation or would the inclusion of rotation yeah. behind spin change the hyper instabilities develop and we hold it yeah. Great question. So, uh, for all of the simulations considered in this work, we don't consider uh, rotation. Um, although, so building initial data with spins in the neutron stars is quite complicated, but we now have access to a code that allows us to do so. So hopefully we can explore that um, in future projects. Whether or not it would affect the, uh, the development of instabilities, I don't think that has been determined in, 
in numer with numerical studies. Um, so I think the main effect will probably be to possibly even enhance the development of instabilities because they arise due to very small scale fluid um, uh, fluid dynamics. So really it's a, 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 a turbulent motion at small scales uh, that kind of grows. Um, uh, and I could see the spin possibly enhancing the amount of turbulence uh, during the merger uh, just due to sheer motion, yeah. Just a speculative thing, yeah. So I'm curious. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Um, Yeah, this is fascinating. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the origin of the M equals one instability. Yeah. Particularly in the simulations at equal mass ratio with circular orbits, yeah. where the initial, you know, they almost must have perfect exchange right. symmetry. Yeah. So what is sourcing it yeah. exactly? Which direction does it align with? Yeah. Like, how does that come about? Yeah. So uh, some previous studies that have been done, especially uh, one by Pascalides et al. in around 2017 ran some very high resolution simulations uh, where they saw the development of this instability and they tracked it down to kind of what appears to be turbulent motion. Um, so basically you have these two vortices that form and if they do not reach the center at the same time, so any kind of truncation error would, would you know, shift the, the position of these vortices. If they don't reach the center at the same time, this could kind of lead to, to a small instability which then grows due to the differential rotation. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> so the question about, do you assume that the neutron sky is all uniform or you have some edge effect? I mean... Yes, so uh, the way we run these simulations, uh, uh, we, we, con we build initial data assuming that the neutron stars have an edge, like there's some cutoff in the density uh, for the surface. But then when we put them into a numerical simulation, we have to kind of amplify the atmosphere so that for stability purposes for our simulations. This is not expected to have a major effect on the dynamics, but so I guess to try to answer your question, in the initial conditions, there's a very sharp edge of the neutron star. Uh, in the simulations, that edge is still there, but uh, it's kind of, it goes up to some edge or to some uh, artificial atmosphere, basically. Um, that, yeah, it's much, the atmosphere is much smaller than, than the density in the star. I was wondering, so it's it's fantastic that there's a smoking gun mm -hmm. uh, observable for, for this phase transition, but I was wondering whether is it conceivable that we might also see traces or get some information about that from earlier in the merger or even the late stages of the spiral? Or? Certainly. I, I think it would depend sensitively on something like the mass ratio, whether you have tidal interactions before the merger that could maybe uh, push the, the densities to above the, the conditions for a phase transition. Um, uh, as far as I know, uh, some studies have been done where you have quarks during the end spiral, uh, but the effect is mostly to remove the quarks. Uh, there's some kind of, uh, uh, the, the star essentially expands a bit and the density drops so that you remove the quarks, any quarks present, um, although that is not always the case. It, it's, it depends very sensitively on uh, where your phase transition occurs, the mass of your initial stars, and something like the mass ratio. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, there are no effects, or yeah, there are no effects in the in spiral from from such phase transitions. I think the dominant um, effects are from the uh, the in spiral of the two stars. I was wondering if the in a different astrophysical scenario during an or collapse or no, mm -hmm. uh, has anyone looked at whether orbital confinement could change I yes. guess the gravitational signal, but yes. also the exposure and the hydrodynamics? Certainly. Like yeah, I think there have been some simulations that look at this. Um uh as far as I recall, so there you would expect a burst of gravitational waves, not not some kind of long signal. Um, and I think 
the effect that I've seen in papers. Uh, there's been a recent one by Soliga, I think, Ana Soliga, uh, where you get an enhancement or a, a larger amplitude of the burst if there is a phase transition. But mostly this has to do with the oscillations of the proto-neutron star. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, if there is a phase transition, you can enhance the oscillations of that proto-neutron star, which leads to possibly louder bursts. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think, first of all, I don't think anyone has looked at this in the full GR picture. Um, people have done approximations where you start with some stable neutron star configuration and perturb it such that you get in a, a phase transition and get a burst of gravitational waves, but that's not at all the full picture. Um, but that's kind of, I think, the, where the research is along those lines these days. So I would now like to ask, I guess, do you know what it is about the deconfinement transition? Like the physics of that? Yeah. This? So this is very speculative, but I, I think I have a backup slide, hopefully, for this. Um, so, yeah. So if we look at the rotation profiles of the post merger remnant, uh, one thing that we're seeing. Um, so yeah, just to emphasize this instability develops only when you have differential rotation in the remnant. So that regions near the center rotate faster than regions further away. This is typically what a rotation profile looks like for that post-merger remnant. Um, uh, this is what it looks like in the case where you have only hadronic degrees of freedom. And when we allow for deconfinement phase transition, what we're seeing is that there's an increase near the, the, the core of the, the rotation rate. Um, there's this kind of double cord feature. Um, uh, so it's very speculative, but one thing I think could be happening is that there's, uh, there's a compactification of your remnant, more matter moves inward, and that kind of suppresses, uh, you know, you have a, a mass closer to, to the axis of rotation um, that could suppress uh, these kinds of um, uh, quadrupole oscillations of, of the star, but yeah. Immediately, have you tried just setting up differentially rotating initial data with densities yeah. in this regime? Not yet, but yeah. M equals one instabilities. that would be a great uh, direction. So uh, those kinds of instabilities have been studied for neutron stars, just purely hadronic stars. Um, and they can develop uh, quite commonly if you have differential rotation. But I don't think a systematic study where you have the same star um, but one has a deconfinement phase transition above some density uh, has been done. So that, that would be a really interesting yeah, approach. Yeah. Just to get some, some handle on whether this is the actual mechanism for the suppression. Yeah. Yeah. 